Is the NIV missing verses? Internet memes from King James only as say so, like this one that was shared on Facebook by two different relatives of mine. They point out that portions of verses like Luke 9:56 and whole verses like Matthew 18:11 have gone quote unquote missing. I was asked about this very thing by a friend I play sports with, a guy who goes to a Pentecostal church just the other week after our weekly pickup game. I think he saw this video on TikTok where some guy shows that the NIV doesn't have certain verses that are in the King James Version. And this was probably the earliest King James only argument I heard, in fact, as a 10 year old. And it seemed utterly obvious to me that it was 100% wrong to take verses out of the Bible. Any quote unquote Bible that took out quote unquote verses was quote out quote up quote bad. This argument by itself made me a King James onlyist before I ever heard the full and more elaborate King James only argumentation a few years later in high school. Literally every single King James onlyist I've ever read points to these missing verses as a signal reason for their rejection of modern Bibles like the NIV here. And let's be clear, they're not talking about this. An actual picture of a King James Version from Church Bible Publishers, where you can see that on both pages at the end of Revelation of all books, there are open slots where verses have literally gone missing in the printing process. Now, King James Onlyists who share these internet memes about missing verses always go on to say that these verses were omitted not by accident, but on purpose, in order to deny or subvert the truths within them, usually Christ's deity or his blood. If this is true, we have a truly massive problem on our hands. The top Christian Bible scholars who worked on modern Bible translations, in English at least, are all either colluding to take parts of God's word from us, or they've been duped by Satan to do the same. But is any of this true? I'm not actually a fan of The Office, but I'm an internet dweller, and I will let the cast of The Office tell us if indeed this is true. No. If you are persuaded by my argument so far from the office, you may stop the video. I give you permission to watch a full 10 YouTube shorts instead, as long as they're not too dumb. I like woodworking tips and Steph Curry and John ja Morant highlights myself. I recommend those. But if you'd like to hear more, well, I've got more stuff I could say. Not sure though how that song from the office didn't persuade you already. You must have mental neurons of steel. I salute thee. And I have three things to say, three arguments to make that will melt your neurons and reshape them or your money back. First, at least be aware that the vast majority of faithful evangelical Christians who believe the Bible and read Greek think that the King James Version has extra verses, not that the modern versions have missing ones. If you're going to treat any argument fairly, no matter what it is, you need to listen to its best representatives. I'm honestly shocked by how many Christians don't even think to wonder why obviously conservative, inerrantist Christian scholars would endorse Bibles that are missing verses. But then that was me. As a 10 year old, it literally did not occur to me to question the narrative that immediately formed in my mind when I was told by a person I trusted that modern versions omit verses. They could only be doing this, I thought, in order to continue the work of Satan in the garden, who fooled Eve by asking, yea, hath God said? It's hard for me to judge others harshly when I myself committed the same error. But let's remember what the Bible says here. Whoever answers a matter before hearing it has brought folly and shame down upon himself. You don't want that. And remember, the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. Love demands that you put the best spin possible on other people's statements, the best spin that you can for as long as you can. If you don't love your neighbor as yourself, if all you really wanna do is slap other Christians in the face and display your superior knowledge, display your virtue, then this video is not for you. And that's true no matter what side you're on. But if you want to be responsible and careful, if you believe that blessed are the peacemakers, then keep watching. I'm gonna do my best to briefly explain the mainstream perspective on these things. I'm actually not going to give both sides, although I've done that in other videos, because the King James only side is readily available not only in my videos, but all over the internet. The best proponent of the King James only side, in my opinion, is E.F. Hills in his book, Text and Time, A Reformed Approach to Textual Criticism, which was retitled as the King James Version Defended. Okay, so the mainstream perspective. 
It makes intuitive sense to think that the King James is older than modern versions, so any verses or words that are present in the King James but not in modern versions must have been, quote, taken out. Again, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? And usually I don't even argue this point with people because I actually think that English readability of the often archaic King James is the far more important debate. But you, steel neuron person, you can follow me, so please do. The argument here is actually not about English translations at all, like I thought it was when I was a teenager and first answered these matters before I heard them, when I first got into the more elaborate case about the King James. This debate is about ancient Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, and when viewed from that perspective, the situation is actually the opposite. It was the old King James Version that relied on younger Greek New Testament manuscripts. The new versions rely on older Greek New Testament manuscripts that have been subsequently brought to the attention of scholars. The actual differences between these two sets of manuscripts, as we'll see, far, far are outweighed in number by the similarities, and the actual differences are usually very, very minor, like this difference, which I chose at random from a site I made. In the Greek manuscripts relied upon by the King James translators, prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for Peter. In the Greek manuscripts relied upon by modern translators, prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God concerning Peter. The Greek words are slightly different, and I'll pronounce them huper versus peri. This necessarily causes a difference in translation, but the meaning is the same. This is very, very common in the New Testament manuscript tradition. And to understand why, we've got to go back in time. Before the invention of printing, all of the copies of the Hebrew Bible and all of the copies of the Greek New Testament had to be handmade. And no human is capable of copying a text by hand of any substantial length perfectly Apparently, some slightly inattentive scribe somewhere at some point in time accidentally wrote down a word that was very similar and meant the same thing, and later scribes copied that minor error in that passage I just read from Acts 12. God most certainly could have ensured that certain copies were perfect or that all of them were, but we have no evidence that he did this, and importantly, no Bible verses telling us that he would. The one that seems to come closest is Matthew 5.18 where Jesus promises that not a jot or a tittle will pass from the law until all is fulfilled. That initially does sound like a promise of perfect manuscript copies of the Bible. But I don't think this is what Jesus was saying, precisely because we have no perfect copies of the Hebrew Bible or of the Greek New Testament. They all contain minor variations, like the wise men came and saw baby Jesus in one old manuscript, actually many, and the wise men came and found baby Jesus in more manuscripts. The reason I say we have no evidence of perfect copies is that every single time we've discovered ancient manuscripts of the Bible and medieval ones, they've differed at least a little from others that we have, most often in the way that I've described. The, the, there are no two of any size that are perfectly alike. And this is incredibly important. Even if some of these Greek and Hebrew manuscripts of the Bible are perfect, all the jots and tittles, none missing or added, and all in the right order, God has not told us which ones are perfect or how to find the ones that are perfect. I'll say a little more about this in my second point. Jesus' point in Matthew 5 must have been that the whole law would remain in effect until all is fulfilled. To be clear, I think we have excellent copies of the Greek New Testament and Hebrew Bible, but that we don't have warrant to claim that we have perfect ones. I still believe the Bible is inerrant, however, because whether the church prayed for Peter or concerning him is a distinction without a difference. And the vast, vast majority of differences among biblical manuscripts in Hebrew and Greek are like that one, inconsequential. I built a whole website demonstrating this, kjvparallelbible.org, and I urge you to go look at it. I plan to release another video soonish, maybe more than one, in which I help you do this very thing. I went through the whole New Testament and translated into English with volunteers all of the differences between the two most important editions of the Greek New Testament for English speakers. I think if you look at this site, you will be overwhelmed not by the differences, but by the incredible similarities between the two. I'll never forget the shock I felt when one King James defender looked at the edition of the Greek New Testament on which my favorite preaching translation, the ESV, is based. This is the NIV, but I'll let it stand in for that. And he called it a completely different text from the one underlying his King James. Just, just look as I scroll through, are these completely different? 
Even if you assume that the text has to be absolutely perfectly copied, I still could not call the newest edition of the Greek New Testament radically different or completely different, as I've heard King James defenders say. The Quran is completely different from the New Testament. The latest Oprah Winfrey self-help book is radically different from the New Testament. But under any fair evaluation, the Greek New Testament underlying the King James is not massively different from the one used by the New International Version. We have somewhere around 5,000 handwritten copies of various portions of the New Testament. Some of them are tiny scraps. Most of them are collections of portions of the New Testament, like the Gospels or Acts or Paul's epistles or the general epistles or just Revelation. A very few of them are copies of the entire New Testament. And none of them, of any size, is exactly the same as any other. So before you translate the New Testament into any language, someone has to decide which variants you're going to go with in any given place. Let me pick another random example. Someone has to decide whether we go with the blood of bulls and goats, as some manuscripts have it, or the blood of goats and bulls, as other ones do in Hebrews 9.13. This is called textual criticism, and it does not mean criticizing the text. There is no way around the necessity of textual criticism. Everybody has to do it. Even to refuse to do it is to do it. To refuse to do textual criticism is simply to accept the textual critical choices that have been made by somebody else in the past. The King James translators were people of the past, and they themselves did textual criticism. They had multiple printed editions of the Greek New Testament in front of them, especially one by a French Calvinist scholar, Robert Estienne, or Stephanus in Latin. He did this in 8, uh, 1550, not 1850. And they had another uh, Greek New Testament done by a French Calvinist scholar, also Theodore Beza, that was done in 1598. They tended to go with Beza over Stephanus, but not always. And you can see evidence of this, not only in the text itself, you can tell what text they presume, what, what they're translating, but also in the preface and in the margins to the 1611 King James like I have here. They mention that some copies of the Greek New Testament read differently than the text that they chose to translate at various places. This is a complex field. There is no way around it. I really can't explain quickly without massive risk of oversimplification. But that's just what the NIV versus King James and ESV versus King James memes do. They massively oversimplify the debate. And yet, King James onlyists are constantly warning other Christians who carry NIVs or ESVs to church. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. I wonder if our brothers in King James onlyism really mean this. Do you, brothers, really think that all the translators of contemporary Bibles, including my godly friend Vern Poitras, whom I know personally, who worked on the ESV, and the faithful evangelical scholar Doug Moo of the NIV, who's written the best commentary on Romans, they're going to burn in hell because of their choice of Greek New Testament editions? And King James Onlyus must remember the previous verse, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. In the perspective of most conservative Christians who can read Greek or Hebrew or both, the manuscripts of the Greek New Testament upon which the King James is ultimately based tended to mildly expand and clarify the text by naming a person, for example, instead of using a pronoun like, and Jesus said unto them instead of, and he said unto them. So to most people who've studied these matters in depth, the King James is, in a sense, adding to God's word. I simply do not believe that these verses in Revelation are condemning the sincere efforts of the King James translators or of modern translators to weed out extraneous words that have crept into the Greek New Testament manuscript tradition to come up with the best choice of the best variant. If there is a perfect copy of the New Testament out there in Greek, God has not told us which one it is. He has left us to our best lights to choose between charity shall cover the multitude of sins and charity covereth a multitude of sins. You may want to stick with the tried and true, the choices made by the King James translators, and I don't mind that choice, but at least be aware that the vast majority of faithful evangelical Christians who believe the Bible and read Greek think that the King James has some extra verses in it, not that the modern versions have missing ones. How are those neurons doing? This was the hardest and most complicated point. The next two will be easier and funner. Second, the most cited and most gifted proponents of King James onlyism do not believe there is a perfectly pure copy of the Greek New Testament. Even they acknowledge the existence of variants in the manuscript tradition. Most of the people who share memes like the one that I started with insist that they do have a perfect copy of the Greek New Testament. It's the Textus Receptus, as it's called. 
I collect doctrinal statements from King James only churches and I'm up to about 100. I'd say that about 20 to 25% of them mention the Textus Receptus as the perfectly preserved copy of the Greek New Testament. Many others just refer to the King James. But there's simply no way around this. In my rather broad experience, very, very few of the pastors of these churches are aware that there is no the Textus Receptus. There are multiple Textus Receptus editions with, with at least dozens of differences among them possibly hundreds or thousands of differences nobody has yet counted that I know of. I know someone who plans to start, and yet I've never seen any King James-only church doctrinal statement which specifies which edition of the Textus Receptus is the perfect one. You have to go to the upper echelons of the King James-only movement, the most trained and gifted and experienced writers, before you run into people who are aware of the which TR problem. In my experience, those brothers, and I do regard them as brothers, do offer some good faith answers, but they don't all agree with one another in their answers, except on one point. Whatever the King James translators did is right. If they chose, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know, over he knoweth not yet as he ought to know, then we should make the same choice. If they chose, show me your faith without your works, as they did, over show me your faith by your works, whatever the translators did is right, their holy will abideth. But there are other historic translations of slightly different TRs that made different choices. The translators of the historic Dutch Bible, the 1637 Staten Vertaling, made multiple decisions different from those of the King James translators. The translators of the historic Portuguese Bible, likewise. And I've seen incredibly few defenders of the King James explain why we should regard the choices of a certain set of English Bible translators at a certain point in time as perfect, but not that of equally qualified and godly translators from the nearby Netherlands around the same time. The only one I've seen who's really tackled this directly said that the majority of faithful churches in the world speak English, so we should look to the main English Bible for the perfect text. A quick illustration for how this appears to me. The Gospel Coalition is a ministry that people love to hate. They have very passionate enemies on the left and on the right. On the left, the Gospel Coalition, TGC, gets blasted for believing that only men can be pastors. On the right, TGC gets blasted for being too nice to the people on the left. But a couple months ago, TGC put out an article that surprisingly managed to unite leftist progressives and right-wing Christians together. Everybody hated this article because it made frankly cringy comments comparing specific portions of the marital sexual act to Christ's relationship to his church. I will say no more. I just noticed, and I wasn't the only one, that everybody to the left thought that that article was wrong and stupid, and everybody to the right thought that that article was wrong and stupid. Just as Republicans and Democrats united to sing God Bless America on September 11th, so for Eight social media minutes, progressive and conservative Christians found one tiny square millimeter of common ground. Now, here's the point of my illustration. I've been describing in this video the mainstream view of the King James and the Textus Receptus, as described by the most careful, influential, and responsible proponents of King James-only viewpoints. But Christians to their right and left both unite in seeing the TR is perfect view as impossible. On the right, the Ruckmanites can see the inconsistency of saying that the Textus Receptus is perfect, but giving confusing and inconclusive arguments when they are asked, okay, which Textus Receptus is perfect? The Ruckmanites on the right solve the inconsistency by saying that it's the King James itself that's perfect, that the Greek is basically not needed. On the other side, on my side, which I hate to call the left because I'm very conservative, we solve the inconsistency that's in the mainstream uh, King James only movement by saying what the King James translators believed, that God has not promised us a perfect text of the Hebrew Bible or of the Greek New Testament. And we just have to do our best to study out each variant among the manuscript copies we have. I stand by my wording in this second point. The best King James and TR defenders that I know, like E.F. Hills and the Trinitarian Bible Society, definitely know that TR editions differ. But to my mind, they are very much unclear and confusing on this point because you will constantly hear these brothers talk as if God promised to perfectly preserve his word. But then, like the Trinitarian Bible Society, they will decline to judge between Textus Receptus editions. I see this as a massive, central, fatal inconsistency. But I'm glad these brothers do acknowledge that Textus Receptus editions differ. Number three, missing verses are a known issue. They did not arise after the advent of modern critical approaches to Scripture. Nor did the Bible remain exactly the same for all time until Westcott and Hort messed it all up. 
That's what I was told as a teen about West Cotton Horde. Before these wicked men, the church had precisely the same words for countless centuries, I was told. West Cotton Horde were the really bad guys who dredged up some faulty, like literally trashy copies of the Greek New Testament, at least one of which was probably forged, I was told. At least I think I was told that. That's very common to be uh, argued. And for unaccountable but wicked reasons, they overthrew the Textus Receptus and substituted a completely different underlying text for the New Testament. Or again, so I was told. The narrative I was handed as a teenager by my otherwise faithful and trustworthy pastor, who I now believe was simply repeating in ignorance talking points that ignorant people had handed him. The narrative I was given was that for centuries the church was doing just fine with the Textus Receptus, but suddenly in 1881 everything changed. But that just is not true. Careful Christians have known about textual variants in the manuscript tradition from the earliest days of the church. I could give you many, many quotations proving this. Instead, I will rely on the testimony of one authority who surely ought to know. He is, in fact, the editor of the first Textus Receptus, Erasmus of Rotterdam. The University of Toronto, they say Toronto up there, I just learned this last uh, fall, has been making excellent English translations of Erasmus's massive, massive amounts of work. And in 2019, they put out a volume that contains, among many other things, Erasmus's explanation and defense of his first printed Greek New Testament, which accompanied a new translation of the Vulgate, the Latin Vulgate. This is the very first Textus Receptus. It feels to me like Erasmus is talking right now, this minute, and he's talking to the very King James Onlyists who say they are defending his work. Brothers, will you hear Erasmus? He's actually more severe than I would be, by far, as you'll see. But he shows unequivocally that manuscript variants were a known issue in his day. Erasmus said, If there are any who fear that if a change is anywhere introduced into a Bible translation, the authority of sacred literature will be called into question. They should know that already for a thousand years the manuscripts, whether Latin or Greek, have not agreed in every respect. Agreement would not, in fact, be possible given not only the large number of copyists down through the ages, he means, but also their ignorance, carelessness, and indiscretion, not to mention the many alterations made by the semi-educated or at least the inattentive. That's him being more severe than I would be. Yet has anything happened to the Christian religion because for many centuries now, Jerome has offered one reading, Cyprian another, Hilary another, Ambrose another, Augustine another? Among these authors, you will find readings that are not only different, but even contradictory. And I think here he's talking about not only underlying text, but translation. I'm not totally sure. Though they agree on the essentials of the Christian faith, and that's Erasmus's big point. Erasmus goes on to speak of the church father Origen, who lived from about 185 to 253, all the way back that far. And already in his day, Erasmus says, Origen complained about puzzling variations in the Gospels. If you inspect the old manuscript codices, that's books, that were used in those times in public worship, this is what we call lectionaries today, collections of scripture readings, you will scarcely find two that agree with each other. Certainly it is clear that Augustine used manuscripts that were not free from faults. And yet all down through the centuries, here's Erasmus still, the authority of scripture has stood firm. And I say amen. If textual variation in the manuscripts completely deprives the scriptures of their reliability, then remember, there is manuscript variation in the Hebrew, in the Greek, and in the Latin. Erasmus talks in some places exactly the way I do on this channel so often, he says. I too would wish that in sacred literature nothing was corrupt. He means textually corrupt. Nowhere was there any disagreement. And yet, while it's easy to wish for this, it never has been the fact, nor I think ever will be. But Erasmus is more severe than I would be precisely because he's an academic, where I'm a churchman. I'm not denying that he cared about the church, nor that I care about academics. I think those who can read Greek should speak truth to Christ's sheep about textual variants. I don't think they should be allowed to remain ignorant of these things. But I also would take care to speak more carefully than Erasmus did, which is why I love another quote that I'm going to read to you that I recently came across from John L. Dagg, written in 1857, which is before 1881 if you check. This is the balance that I would like to keep striking. He says, Although the scriptures were penned under the unerring guidance of the Holy Spirit, it does not follow that a continued miracle has been wrought to preserve them from all error in transcribing. On the contrary, we know that manuscripts differ from each other. And where readings are various, that is, where they differ, only one of them can be correct. A miracle was needed in the original production of the scriptures, and accordingly a miracle was wrought. But the preservation of the inspired word, in as much perfection as was necessary to answer the purpose for which it was given, did not require a miracle, and accordingly it was committed to the providence of God. 
Now, it's a little difficult in theology to precisely define what counts as a miracle versus what counts as normal divine providence, but it's a you know it when you see it kind of thing. Jesus turning the water into wine in an instant was a miracle. Even though God's sustaining power in nature is necessary every time, winemakers do the same thing over the course of months. So Dag is saying that God acted directly, miraculously to inspire the scriptures, but he acted in his normal providential way to preserve them. Dag goes on, yet the providence which has preserved the divine oracles has been special and remarkable. The consequence is that although the various readings found in the existing manuscripts, that's what we've been talking about in this video, are numerous, we are able in every case to determine the correct reading so far as is necessary for the establishment of our faith or the direction of our practice in every important particular. So little, after all, do the copies differ from each other, and I say amen, that these minute differences, when viewed in contrast with their general agreement, render the fact of that agreement the more impressive, and may be said to serve practically rather to increase than to impair our confidence in their general correctness. The rise of Westcott and Hort in between Dagg's day and ours does not change my agreement with Dagg one whit. He says exactly what I would say, down to the syllable. I think he says what Westcott would say, at least, but that's another video. This is just gold, Dag's quote. Some people have always been alarmed by the existence of variants in the manuscript tradition of the Greek New Testament. Some have wanted to hide this fact from lay people, fearing it will harm their faith. I share some of that fear, but as I so often say, this is the situation our good God gave us. And I've come to conclude that the best place to hear the truth is from people who believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that the Bible is God's inspired and authoritative and inerrant word. In case you haven't realized, I am such an one. So is the NIV that I've got right here, is it missing verses compared to the King James? Is the ESV or CSB or NASB or NLT missing verses? No. This meme assumes that the King James is the standard, but it's not. The inspired Hebrew and Greek are the standard. At the very least, when you see a meme like this, recognize that, number one, the vast majority of faithful evangelical Christians who believe the Bible and read Greek think that the King James has extra verses, not that the modern versions have missing ones. Number two, that the most cited and most gifted proponents of King James onlyism do not believe that there is a perfectly pure copy of the Greek New Testament, but instead acknowledge the existence of variants. Recognize number three, that missing verses, quote unquote, are a known issue that did not arise after the advent of modern critical approaches to scripture, but have been discussed essentially throughout the history of the church, the entire history of it. Someone made a comment on a recent video of mine that the shallows are always clear. When you have a simplistic understanding of a complex issue, you will experience your viewpoint as utterly obvious. I've done this. I think we've all done this with various things. But men put away such childish things as simplistic understandings. And Christians ought to be humble enough to acknowledge when their internet memes are only clear because they're lying at the bottom of the kiddie pool. God gave us a complex situation. He preserved for us about 5,000 manuscripts of the Greek New Testament, each including a varying amount of that New Testament and none of any size agreeing perfectly with any other. He also chose not to tell us how to find or choose the right reading in any given place. So I give you liberty, brothers and sisters. I actually don't mind at all if you weigh that evidence differently than I do, if you prefer the majority text or the Byzantine tradition, if you know that terminology. I just urge you, if you've shared a meme like the one that I'm evaluating, unshare it and stop talking as if the matter is simple. Stop telling people that their Bibles are untrustworthy. And then I tell you, make or use a translation of whatever text you prefer into fully intelligible contemporary English. Edification requires intelligibility. That's the teaching of 1 Corinthians 14. That's the overriding purpose of this channel. I talk with some reluctance about textual criticism, but I've been asked so many times to address this topic that I decided to try to tackle it from this particular angle. I pray it was helpful for you.